Thank you for joining me for the Fire UI Hands-On Workshop. My name is Serena Dupont and I'm a Senior Product Manager here at Embarcadero Technologies. Now let's have a look at the webinar agenda. First, I'm going to provide you with a quick overview, which will be followed by multiple demos. First, we're going to provide an overview on the Fire UI Designer the list view and list box, the differences between the two components and tips and tricks, creating common application screens such as a profile screen, sign up screen and the settings screen for your multi-device applications, how custom styling works and when to apply custom styles, and overall app navigation tips. This session is designed for beginners but can also serve as a great refresher on do's and don'ts when it comes to building multi-device applications. So let's get started. Now with RAD Studio, we provide both native and custom styling for iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac applications using the FireMonkey framework. We also have support for Retina images, so you can use the uh, T-Image component to load in images in different sizes. So if you're wanting to support multiple different iOS devices or multiple different Android devices, it's recommended that you load in images that have support for multiple resolutions. We also have support for tab control styling and a style lookup property that you can leverage for all the different UI controls, allowing you to quickly change the look of a user interface control. Now, when it comes to designing for different form factors, it's important to keep in mind that we have many different properties that you can choose from to ensure that your application looks nice across different form factors and orientations. So you can use alignment and anchors to align your controls. So for example, if you have a toolbar button, you could use align left to anchor that control left on the toolbar. We also have anchors for controlling the position of the control on the form itself. And if you're looking to have a user interface that looks different on in portrait mode than landscape mode, then it's recommended to use a separate form for each orientation. We also have something called form family, which loads the correct form depending on the target device when working with different forms for landscape and portrait. Now let's have a look at the key component differences. If you're coming from desktop development, it's real good. this is a really good table to have a look at. So if you're, for example, using a T-Tree view today or a T-Grid in your Windows applications, on mobile, you'd be looking at a T-List view, a T-List box, or a T-Grid control. I would really recommend using T-List view. We also have something called the Items Designer that lets you create easily create custom layouts with multiple images in a list view row, for example, multiple labels, glyph buttons, etc. And that's built into Route Studio. There's also a T-List box, which is designed for short input forms or um, setting screens, and then T-Grid if you're, for example, building an iPad application. Now on the desktop, if you're currently using a T-Radio group or a T-Radio button, we recommend creating a segmented control, which can be done by using T-Speed buttons and defining a group property or using a T-list box with check marks, or in the case of Android, you can also use radio buttons. Radio buttons are really not used on iOS, but there are applications that use them on Android. If you currently have a checkbox in your desktop application, then you'd be looking at using a T-switch control for both iOS and Android. And if you're just building an Android application, for example, a companion application that leverages app tethering between your VCL Windows application and your uh, Android application, you could also use T-checkbox. Now, when it comes to overall application menus and navigation, if you're currently using T-Menu Bar or T-Main Menu on the desktop, you'd be looking at either a toolbar with speed buttons on mobile, the tab control, or the multi-view component. And we're going to cover all of those in the demos in just a couple of minutes. Now, when it comes to tab controls in iOS and Android, we have built-in behavior services that automatically will load the tab items and display them at the top on Android, which adheres to the UI guidelines, and at the bottom on iOS. And on iOS, they usually show are shown with glyph icons, and you can choose from predefined ones, or you can also load in your own custom icons. On Android, they're usually shown with just text, no glyph buttons, and aligned to the top. Now, when it comes to the segmented toolbar, you want to parent a T layout control to the toolbar, and then set the layout alignment to center to be able to parent the buttons to the layout. And we have different demos that ship with the product that you can look at to help you get started with that. But it's really just multiple T-Speed button controls. There's a group property on T-Speed button that you want to define, and you can name that whatever you like. And then you want to select from the segmented button styling to then style 
AT speed button as a segmented control. Now there is no concept of a radio group on iOS, so you should not be using radio buttons. Instead, what you should be using for iOS and Android, you should use either a T-list box, and then that you can leverage the accessory of a check mark to set a check mark for any of the items that you're selecting. Or you could set up a T-speed button with a group name to set up a segmented control to allow the user to select an option. On Android specifically, you could also use radio buttons as they are common on Android, but not on iOS. Now, when it comes to creating lists, you can use the T-list box component or you can use the T-list view component. And so when it comes to creating a settings list just for a short screen or an input uh, form, for example, like a sign up screen, it's recommended to use T-list box. And when it comes to creating a long scrollable list, it's recommended to use T-list view. And the T-list view has built-in appearance modes to allow you to quickly design and lay out your application with a custom list control. And we also have a built-in items designer that lets you create a custom row layout with multiple images, text, buttons, etc. And then that custom row layout is repeated throughout your list. And that can be easily done visually using the list view item designer. And with that, let's have a look at Fire UI in action with our demos. So here you can see the multi-device designer. At the top, we have a style drop-down menu. Now this menu lets you select your design time style so that you can preview what the application is actually going to look like at runtime, but while you're developing and designing your application at design time. Now most of your application UI should be designed on the master, and then any particular platform or form factor specific tweaks should be done at the view level. If you're designing an application for iPhone versus Android or for iOS versus Android and you're only looking to make a platform specific change for iOS versus Android, you can just create a single platform specific view. So for example, if you wanted to have a button display different message on an iOS device versus an Android device, you don't need to go through the process of creating views for all these different iOS devices. You can just create a single iOS view and you can select from any of the predefined ones. If you wanted to have the UI look different on a tablet form factor on iOS, so for example, an iPad or an iPad mini versus an iPhone, then you would create at least one iPhone form factor and at least one iPad form factor. And that way at runtime when the application is loaded up, the device will either display the iPad view or the iPhone view depending on the target device. And the same logic also applies to Android. So now let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is drop a toolbar onto our form. And you can see in the style lookup property that we have many different options that you can choose from. So we'll just select toolbar style. Next, we're going to place a label onto our form and we want this to be the application label. So we can just say application title. And this is where you would put the actual application title. And the style lookup, we're going to select tool label. This will apply the automatic styling that we would expect for a tool label. So for example, the font size, the font attributes such as bold, etc. And then we can align this to center. If you're planning on placing buttons onto the toolbar, then you're going to want to make some changes to the settings that we just applied to the label. So we're going to place some speed buttons onto our toolbar and those speed buttons uh, will have some properties set. So we're going to select list item button for both of them. And this will apply a nice outline to those buttons. And you can also choose from glyph buttons. So the style lookup property gives you all the predefined elements that are part of the iOS style, Android style, Windows style, Mac style, etc. So let's go list item button here. And then we're going to, we've already parented both of those buttons to the toolbar. And this button we're going to align to left. And uh, you can see the text shifted over. Now we're going to align this one to right. And now if we wanted to add some more buttons here, we could certainly do so. But you can see that the toolbar title, because we had aligned the toolbar text to center automatically is shifting around. So instead of selecting alignment center, we're going to select contents. So whenever you have additional contents on the toolbar beyond a title, you're going to want to select align contents and then go down to the text settings property and go to vertical assign alignment and set that to center and horizontal alignment set to center. And this will perfectly uh, align the title horizontally on the toolbar. 
Now for the button, we want to set some margins as well. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to select right five. And because we also have a button to the left of it, and we don't want those to appear to be connected, we're going to select left five as well. And this will automatically create some spacing. And then we can now go ahead and set some values. So for example, this can be our um, uh, settings button, this can be our save button, and this could be our load button. Generally speaking, when you're working with buttons on a toolbar, you should select uh, you should choose from either text buttons or glyph button. So as I showed just a couple minutes ago, when you select a control, you can go to the style lookup property and select from many different properties. And these are predefined elements for T speed button. You could also use T button, but for toolbar buttons, it's really recommended to use T, T speed button. And uh, as you can see here, these are all three text buttons. It's recommended not to mix and match a text button with a glyph button on a toolbar, although this is something that you will see from time to time that people do. Generally speaking, it's best to keep the same theme, so either use glyph buttons or text buttons. Now, we're also going to put a list view control onto our form. When you're working with scrolling views, it's really recommended that you use the list view control instead of the list box. The list box control on mobile specifically is really designed you know, for short settings forms and, and very short lists in general. If you're talking about a, a long scrolling list, we highly recommend using the list view control because that control was really designed for long lists on mobile devices. And on iOS, we also have native platform rendering support for the list view control. So if you're deploying an application to iOS with the list view control, you can select control type and you can set that to platform. And what that means is that on iOS, it will automatically be rendered using the underlying operating system. If you select it to platform, then on iOS, you can also choose from additional properties called native options. And these options are available to you if you're deploying this application to iOS for T list view. And these are specific to the list view control. Now we support native platform rendering for a number of controls on iOS and Windows. And you can also select the uh, other controls like the T button, T speed, speed button, etc. And you can select control type platform. And what that does is it provides Z order support so that if you're working with, for example, a native maps control and you want to have a toolbar title with buttons, they can all coexist on the same plane and there's no overlapping of the controls on top of the natively rendered controls. Now let's have a look at, let's change this back to styled and let's have a look at a list view control. Now the list view control has an option called item appearance and then if you browse down to item, you can select from many different predefined appearance modes. And what this means is that they, these are appearances that we have designed to cover the key UI layouts that you would come across on mobile when it comes to working with list controls. So for example, image list item, image list item bottom, de bottom detail, etc. Once you've selected an appearance, you can then click the plus and you can now see all the different options that are part of this. So for example, you can have a glyph button object appearance. You can select that, set that to visible or false, and you can do that for any of the different elements that are part of this predefined appearance. Now to see some data at design time, I can go to the prototype bind source. And this is a really good tip. Whenever I lay out applications, I very frequently will use the prototype bind source component to allow me to quickly prototype the user interface without having to go through the steps of connecting to an actual database. So you can just right click, select add fields, and then you can hold down the shift key to select multiple data fields. And then you can go to view tool windows, live bindings designer to visually bind the sample data into the list view control. So as you can see here, the list view based on the item appearance, image list item bottom detail has provided us with many different options that we can bind to. So for example, I can select bitmap name can be my item text and bitmap detail can be my alpha color. And then bitmap, item.bitmap can be bitmap one, and so on and so forth. And you can easily uh, reset this so that you can see the bindings. You can see all the, the data fields bound into the different uh, list item fields. And this is really a quick way of um, showing 
showing data at design time when you're just prototyping an application. As you can see here, this particular list view shows the arrow. That is something you should only display if there's actual additional information that the user can tap on on their device. So in this particular case, I'm going to select Accessory, Visible, and set it to False because I'm not providing an additional screen that the user can tap into and, and to view additional information. Now, most mobile applications have a certain number of screens that every application has. And those screens consist of, for example, a sign-up form, a settings screen, and a profile screen. And we have some great demos to help you get started. Now, the settings demo is a really good example of how you can quickly build a settings screen using a list box control and the tab control. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a really good example of using a list box because it's a short list instead of a long scrolling list, in which case you would want to be using the T-List View component. Now, this is designed as a, using a tab control. So what we have here is we have a single tab control that's aligned to the client with two tab items. And this is tab item one, and we can click on the dot down here and navigate to tab item two. And the way this is designed is if you click on an item, for example, personal here, it navigates you to tab item two, and there it's going to display additional information. And uh, you can see we're using an actionless component here, and we have set up an on-click event. And in the on-click event, we're going to execute the uh, change tab action. And this is a predefined action that has built-in animation for sliding from one tab to another tab. And that gives you that nice slide transition as you're navigating between different tabs. And using the tab control, another key setting that we've uh, enabled here is the uh, um, tab position none. And what tab position none does, it gives you these two dots at the bottom. And these are design time only dots to allow you to quickly navigate between all the different tabs that you have. And at runtime, those are not visible, which then makes it possible to set up events for showing and hiding the different tabs. And that's a really a common paradigm for building mobile applications is to use the tab control with these invisible tabs. You can see we also have bottom. If we set it to bottom, you would see the standard uh, tab display. And you could also set it to platform default, at which in which case you would see the tabs on the top for Android, because that's the default. And if I switch this here to iOS, you would see them on the bottom. And for iOS, then you could also select uh, icons, because that's the standard way to display tabs on iOS is with icons. The standard way to display them on Android is aligned to the top, just with text. So now I'm going to select the tap control again. And I'm going to change it back to none. Let's have a look at the rest here. So what we have here is a single list box. And then we've defined a number of settings. First is style lookup, we set to transparent list box. And that gives you this transparent background here. So that's a, a key setting that we've defined. And then we've also gone in and select grouping kind to grouped. And you can see when we select grouping kind to grouped, when you're adding a header, that header is shown um, with a, a transparent background, but the actual items are shown with this white filled background so that it's easy to see the header, but which part of the settings is the header, the title for that section versus the actual list box items. And then so here we have account type, payment type, uh, renewal type, these are all just list box items. And then for each item we can set the style. So we set a list box item write detail. Um, and you can go back and you can toggle between this detail, right detail, Let me set this back to right detail. And then once you define that, you can go to item data for each list box item, and you can choose from different options. So for example, here it's set to monthly, written text is renewal type, bitmap is empty, so as you can see there's no bitmap defined here, which you could, could define. You would have to change the style lookup property because the style lookup property for each list box item exposes the different options that you can then set via the item data property. And then it's set to A more because you can click it. You can also choose from check mark, detail info button, or no check mark, or no accessory at all. So in this case, it's set to more because there's a second screen. The way this is structured is that we've just added list box items. So you could add more list box items if you wanted to and then you would just select those box as a whole and you would resize it and uh, 
you would then just select the list box and resize it and increase the height. And you can see it's added a list box item. Then we've parented, in the, these cases, we've parented the switch control, which we've aligned to the right, and then we've set our margins again, so right to 10, so that it doesn't run up right to the side here. And then these individual items here are list box headers and they're defined as a list box group header, so they automatically add some margins here so that you can easily create a sectioned off and subdivided settings screen. And then we have our secondary tab in which you can choose from different options. And here this would be the back button. And this button is also using the change tab action for navigating to tab item one and it's using the built-in animation. Now, another screen that I wanted to show you is the tab slide transition. This is, again, a demo that's provided with Rad Studio 10.2, and it has multiple controls, multiple tab items. And as you can see, these are, again, set to none, so you can at design time navigate between them. Um, and at runtime, you won't see them until you've filled in the form and clicked Next. And this is a great demo because it shows you how to set up um, gestures, how to use the gesture manager to allow you to swipe left or right for navigating between the different um, tabs as you can see here. And this is again a very common paradigm is to allow the user to swipe right to go to the next screen or swipe left to go to the previous screen. In addition we've set up a next button here as you can see again this is going to use the next tab action uh, and as you can see here it's going to go is active tab item one and then it's using the next tab action to navigate to tab item two and then we have the back button set up for navigating back to the previous tab so it's using the built-in previous tab action and this is a great example because it allows you to navigate left or right using the built-in actions and it's then leveraging the built-in um, slide transition also when you're using a gesture so as you're swiping your finger across the screen it's also showing that nice action now another example that I wanted to show you is the profile screen example. And this is a demo that I recently built and blogged about because I wanted to show how easy it is to create a custom UI using FireMonkey. And in this case, I'm using a custom style. We have many different styles provided as part of our premium style pack for our Rad Studio, which you can download from Code Central. This is the dark copper style. And the way this is structured again is we have a toolbar at the top we have two buttons, so in this case I'm using glyph buttons, and I've selected a T-speed button, put it onto my uh, toolbar here, and then I've selected from these different, I've selected from these different uh, styles here. We have the title, which again is aligned to contents because I have additional items on my toolbar. Then at the bottom here, I'm using the tab control with three tabs, and you can see I've selected an icon for each of them. And then we also have here our list box. This is another good example of when you should use list box. This is just a short list, profile list. It has built-in search capabilities, so we have to search in there. And we have each of the four list box items. And as you can see, with the style applied, all I've done here is um, I select a list box item, no detail, because there's no extra text I want to display here. And then I've gone to my item uh, data properties, selected a more to show the accessory arrow. And then I've selected bitmap, edit, and all I've done is loaded a transparent PNG. And what you see here is that I've created some graphics that have the same kind of color fill as the overall style of my application. So that's a really nice UI touch, is to have the icons match part of your theme that you're using so you have a really cohesive look. Another thing that I've done here is I've added a background image. And in this case, the image is set to stretch so that it automatically stretches even if I go ahead and resize the form, for example. And then the margin wrap mode is also set to stretch. This is what the actual original image looks like. So what I've done here, I've set it to 01, but you could also set it to, let's say, 02. And you can see it gives a really nice kind of blended effect by adjusting the opacity on the image. And then we also have a profile image. And the way we've done this, and this is a common uh, look and feel that you see across many mobile applications and also nowadays on, on desktop applications for displaying the profile photo is to display it in a circle. And you can easily do this with a T-circle component that's part of Rad Studio. And then all you have to do is select Fill and you select Bitmap. And then you go into the Bitmap. And as you can see here, this is actually a 
um, square image, so I didn't have to do any masking or cutting myself on any graphics program like Photoshop. You just load it in and then it automatically fits it within the circle. And then you can also set um, different um, options here. For example, you can set the stroke to any kind of color that you want. That's the outline. In this case, I had set it to, again, a color that's similar to the color that you find in the, uh, in the style. And this is another great example of how to build and lay out a screen that's very common in most mobile applications, and that's a profile screen. So profile screen, a setting screen using transitions and animations, and then also the tap slide transi transition screen. And you can see if I switch here to Android, you get the Android look and feel. If I switch to Mac OS, you get the Mac OS look and feel. If I switch to Windows, you get the Windows look and feel. And then of course you can also apply your own custom styles. And these are included styles that we ship with Rat Studio and you can also download and load to a style book a custom style. So if I go back here to my profile screen and I switch to Android, you can see now that the style has changed, the iconography has changed, and now the tabs are displayed at the top instead of the bottom. And that's because we've set our tab control position to platform default. And this leverage is built in Behavior Services in FireMonkey. And Behavior Services in FireMonkey allows you to automatically apply the platform defaults that we have predefined to adhere to the UI guidelines. So, so for example, on Android, the tabs are always displayed at the top, whereas on iOS, they're always displayed at the bottom. And what I've done here is I have a style book control and I've loaded the style for each platform. So all the multi-device styles are platform specific. So if you want to have a custom look and feel across, for example, your iOS application and your Android application, you're going to want to go in and select your Android style and then your iOS style because each of the styles have predefined graphics for all the different resolutions. So 1x, 1.5x, 2x, 3x, etc. And the styles are platform specific. So if you were to only load a custom iOS style and then deploy this application to Android, you would not see the custom style. You would only see the default style. And that's because if you want to have a custom style, you need to apply it separately for each of the platforms as I've done here. Now, another great control to use in your mobile applications and multi-device applications is the multi-view component. And this component transforms itself automatically depending on the orientation, whether your form and the application is shown in portrait mode or landscape mode. And it also has a lot of built-in behaviors. So for example, it can be displayed automatically as a slide and drawer on an iPhone in portrait mode and as a docked panel, as you can see here, on an iPad in landscape mode. So for example, if I switch now to iPhone 4.7 inch, you can see that the drawer menu here is being invoked by this master button and all this is is a T-speed button with the details uh, tool button set as the styling. And then if we go back to our multi-view control, we have an option on it that's called master button. And this is set to master button, which is the control here that um, we placed on the toolbar. So it's just a T-speed button. We've renamed it to master button. And then on a the multi-view control, we've gone to the master button property and selected master button. You can name this whatever you like. The key, the key and most important point to make here is that you have to select the multi-view control and under master button, select the speed button that you want to use to invoke the multi-view. And in this case, this would invoke a slide and drawer. And then if we go, for example, to the iPad and we rotate it, you can now see that this is automatically shown as a docked panel. And so what that means is that if you have this application on an iPad, for example, and this is common with email applications that you might be using on your iPad, that you would see this as a docked panel on the left. And then on an iPhone, you automatically see it as a slide and drawer. So it has, it leverages FireMonkey's uh, behavior services support and the platform behavior support that we built into the Team MultiView to allow you to automatically have the expected behavior across different form factors and orientations. And this is also true if I switch, for example, to an iPhone, Android 5 inch phone, you can see this also has the, um, the, uh, 
drawer button here or the details tool button and you can select this and customize the UI for this however you like. You can select this and change this to a drawer tools button if you wanted to. It's just up to you to decide how you want to invoke that menu. But this is a really powerful control with many different properties that you can set. And another great example of a demo that shows you how to build multi-device application navigation easily into your application. So for example, I can go in and uh, deploy this to an iPhone 6 running on the simulator on my Mac. Here you can see the app running. You can see I have my uh, slide and drawer. I can invoke it uh, by clicking the tapping the button and I can also slide it right back out of view. And with that, I'm going to open it up for some questions. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, Serene. So uh, let's have a quick look um, and see if we have uh, a few questions here. Please bring, um, continue to put your questions through into the uh, the chat log. Uh, I see there's a few that have arrived already. Um, Serena, there, are you uh, are you there? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so there was a um, question here. What's the meaning of the small mobile phone icon to the right bottom in the list view? So that is an indicator that we added a design term to indicate whenever you have selected control type for that control in the uh, object inspector and have set it to platform. So for both iOS and Windows, we provide native control rendering using the underlying operating system for a select number of controls. So for example, for the list view, we support native rendering on iOS and we have some specific list view options, the native options that I showed during the webinar, that you can select if you want to have the control rendered using the underlying operating system instead of rendering it using FireMonkey styles. That has a design term property called control type. You can find in the object inspector 40 list view and if you set it to style, you won't see that little icon. If you set it to platform, you'll see the little mobile icon indicator and that's designed to show you visually at design time that you've set control type to platform instead of using the, the style support or the styling support. Yeah, yeah this is, it's, it's pretty much impossible to spot the difference at runtime if you've got the, the platform or the style control. And the only thing I've noticed on um, the edit controls is that you get a few additional things if you kind of click in to do the cut, copy, paste, if you use the native ones versus the styled, um, because the styled ones are pixel perfect. So um, bitmap representations. Um, the one downside of using the native ones is you do lose the um, the ease of adding kind of animations and glow effects and stuff like that to the control. Um, but if it's um, if you just need to do some kind of basic stuff with it, then uh, using the native is, is pretty cool. And I, I'm kind of right in thinking that if you choose native and native isn't available on the platform, it would just render the start one anyway, won't it? Right. Okay, cool. Um, so another question here. I need to create a flow chart so someone can click on an upper or lower corner of a square to make changes. Uh, can this be done? We don't have any flow chart specific components. I do think there might be some from a third party, but I don't see why you couldn't build that yourself. I mean, FireMonkey yeah, has a lot of different controls, also rectangles, circles, different shapes. Um, you could build different arrows. There are third-party component packs that would allow you to have the different elements that are part of a flow chart, and then you could put in, you know, gesture support to move them around, etc., in your application. So mm -hmm. just because there's not a, a pre pre-built component for it, it, certainly doesn't preclude you from from building something like that. No, absolutely. And you've got access directly to the canvas for, for the controls as well, um, so you can get directly into that as well. Um, but that's one of the things I really like about FireMonkey, actually, is the way the parenting works, is that um, if you wanted to start building something, um, you can then put controls inside of a control. And one of the things that used to really bug me um, trying to do that on the VCL is that if you had a label inside, um, say, a, a square or a rectangle, um, but when you clicked on the label, that would kind of capture the on-click event. So there's a really, really useful property um, 
on uh, on the fly monkey controls. I'm just trying to remember what the uh, the actual specific name of it is. is um, it's like can, can click or something, isn't it? Um, and um, I'll, I'll have a look at it uh, and, and just check the, the specific name. But what that means, um, hit test, that's what it was. Um, so if hit test is false, then all the on-click um, events get passed directly through to the parent. Um, so that makes kind of building your own kind of controls for doing the, kind of the same thing uh, a lot easier, which is pretty cool. Um, okay. So there's a question here, Mark has, um, when using the FMX forms designer and setting up a tint color for a button, it will paint in the right color on Android, but ignores it on Windows? Is he missing something, or has he got it set up correctly? Yeah, tint support is only, on I is only supported on uh, iOS and Android. So that is because it's not supported on the other platforms. I'll have to double check. I'm pretty sure that that's the case. If you want to send me, Mark, if you want to send me a note, um, I think I have my email on here. At least I was intending to put my email on there. I'm sorry. It looks like I didn't put it on the closing slide, but I'll reply to your, um, I'll reply to your message here and I'll put in my email address. But if I recall correctly, it's just on uh, iOS and Android. I'm actually going to check right now while we're here to have a quick look here. So, yep, so Serena's email address is, uh, her name's in the bottom right corner for the spelling, I'm just serena.dupont at embarcadero.com. Okay, um, is there some way for labels, group boxes, list boxes to be set up uh, a background colour per control manually, just like the VCL? Sorry, can you, let's see, when using the... Um, so the last question, is there some way for labels, group boxes, list boxes to be set up um, with a background colour per control um, manually, just like in the VCL? FireMonkey, FireMonkey is different in the, the way that the styling works. Um, I'm not sure if you're thinking about, like, for example, for the list box, you could set a custom background fill colour. Um, for the label... Are you talking about like an actual background fill that takes up the whole area of the label? And the same for group boxes. You should be able to customize the style. So one of the, the things about FireMonkey that's really great is that you can fully customize the styling. So if you drag and drop a control, and I've done many different uh, webinars and videos on this that you can find on our YouTube channel if you go to youtube.com slash Embarcadero Technet. But if you right click on a control, you can select Edit Custom Style. And that will allow you to create a custom version of that style element that you can then apply to whatever platform you're, you're working with. And that should allow you to make the changes that you're talking about. And again, if you have a specific use case that you want to send over to me, I can have a look at that. Yeah, no, it's just some good look. You can definitely um, style the, the text color. Um, I guess... Um, <clears throat> Worst case, you could just put a rectangle down, put the label inside of it, align it to client, and then just um, uh, and just you'd be able to get the background color that way. Yeah, that would certainly that would certainly be something that's uh, that would work as a uh, as a, as a uh, workaround. workaround. And I wanted to confirm the tint color property. Somebody was asking about the tint color property earlier. That is only supported for mobile platforms on iOS and Android. But if you wanted to have a similar effect on Windows, you could go in and edit the style for that control manually, and uh, and then it would o automatically open up the integrated FireMonkey style designer, which would in turn allow you to change the colors and fill, etc. So just because it's not built in as part of the tint property doesn't mean you can't go in there and edit it yourself. Okay. Um, Vince is uh, saying he's having a problem with trying to use a uh, um, modal dialog. Uh, he's using kind of a, a suggested approach for doing modal forms uh, on mobile that Marco posted out about using a form close handler. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a great approach to go that way. Um, I, I love the way that anonymous methods and I think can be used to um, fire events that happen after you kind of um, close things down a bit as well. Um, the, the only thing I'd say there, um, Vince, is it's a bit hard to uh, comment on a specific or what your application is doing without seeing a sample. Um, if you are concerned uh, about something you're seeing, best thing to do, um, I'm guessing you're probably on update subscription, um, everybody who's bought in the last 
if you bought in the last year, you'll definitely be on it. It's included with the license. Um, just raise a support ticket uh, with a sample, and uh, and the the, web, uh, the, uh, the the support team will be able to kind of um, help point you to what's going wrong, or if there's something wrong, they'll be able to make sure that um, it's followed up with R&D. Okay, there's another question here. Is there also a way to scale text fonts on Android? Like, for example, make the font bigger on a bigger screen and smaller on a smaller screen, so it takes up the same percentage of the screen. You could manually override what's built into the styles. So the styles are defined and uh, set up in a way that the font size should look good and the way that you want it to look on all the different target devices because it's all predefined and we have actually multi-resolution multi support built into the styles. So the 1x is what you see at design time and then 1.5x, 2x, 3x, etc. depending on the target device so that you shouldn't run into that. But if you wanted to, you can select an individual control and then the object inspector go to the text settings property and then you can manually override that. And you could pro programmatically do that as well. We have some examples that you could look for on community.embarcadero.com that, that uh, show you how you can detect the resulting uh, screen resolution of a particular device and then show either a specific form or adjust your, your, uh, your settings based on the, the, the detected screen resolution. So depending on the screen resolution, you could change the font settings if you wanted to manually overwrite that. Yeah, one trick I've done as well actually in the past is um, the, there's a scale property on a lot of controls. Um, so there's a, a scaled layout. Uh, and also you can just use a standard layout and use the scale properly of that manually. Um, and then you can modify that scale value uh, on both the X and the Y. And if it's in 3D, you can use the Z as well. Um, so you can actually put the controls down, lay them out in a specific size. And then uh, if it gets bigger, then it will automatically scale and just make the whole thing bigger um, fitting in. Uh, it can kind of look a bit odd at times. Um, so I kind of prefer manually setting it uh, and doing some calculation based off the form height and width. Um, but the scale property is another way to be able to do that very, very easily. And that way you don't have to kind of modify every single control. You can just say, you know, modify it, uh, the, the layout and every control within the layout then automatically scale with that layout, which is pretty cool. And yeah, the, uh, the label has a scale property on it as well. So I say most of the uh, FMX controls have the scale layout. And because everything's back to drawn, um, that's a pretty awesome thing to be able to use and utilize. OK, um, Tuan saying he's uh, having a problem with the, the date edit. Um, if you could send me, yeah. yeah. If you could send me an email, let me know what platform that is on, then I can follow up with you uh, offline on that. That would probably be the best. Um, I would need to know a little bit more information, like what platform you're using, what version of the OS, etc. That would be helpful. So I'll put my email in here for you, uh, for you, Tuan, if you could reply to me over email. Uh, yeah. So Pierre's uh, asked why aren't all the um, the questions coming back up? It's just because we. Um, as we're answering them, there's quite a few come through, and a few of them are quite long to read, so we're just not having time to type the answer back in and just hit send back to all, so uh, sorry that not all the questions are coming back up through in the text. Um, yeah, I see another question here. Uh, it says, it may be a little bit off topic, but when I make some, I want to make a sound effect to confirm clicks. I don't really know how to set up the deployment manager for the sound file. So one great demo that we have, it's a code snippet demo. And it's installed with the product. And let me just tell you where it is. So when you go to the welcome page in Rad Studio 10.2, on the welcome page, you can click on open a sample project. And then you can go to Object Pascal Mobile Snippets. And then you can navigate to, um, let me see, it's called Play Audio File. And I'll put the path in here as a response to you. But there's a Play Audio File sample that we have as part of Rad Studio 10.2 that shows you how you need to set up the deployment manager depending on the target platform to ensure that that sound clip is deployed um, with your application. So it's under samples, object Pascal, object Pascal, mobile snippets, and it's called the play audio file. We also have some documentation on this on the doc wiki if you want to have a look that further outlines what you need to define to deploy files 
for the different platforms since it varies by platform, but this particular example should have what you're looking for because it takes an existing audio clip and it deploys it to the supported platform so you can deploy to iOS, Android, etc. Okay, there's a question here about the, um, the multi-view. Um, is there a way to kind of make it look pretty, um, basically, um, when you kind of click on the button to bring the drawer out? Um, so basically, it does it automatically. There's a whole set of properties. Um, if you have a look at the samples for the multi-view, um, uh, you can make it kind of appear over the top of the, um, the target region. You can make it push the target region to the right. Um, uh, there's a whole load of different things. You can uh, set the speed of the animation for the draw coming in and out. Um, you can set if it if the draw comes up that the the main area kind of uh, fades down, so you don't it kind of really draws the eye to the, the top area again. Um, so there's some really really cool stuff that you can do with the multi view. It's an exceptionally flexible component. Um, so definitely have a play with it and have a look at the different properties and transitions. Yeah, and another great thing about the multi-view is you can define any button style that you want. You just need to set up a button if you want to use the drawer mode so that you have something that invokes the drawer mode. So you can use a speed button with any kind of glyph styling that you like, name it whatever you like, and then you go to the multi-view control itself, and in the object inspector on the master button, you just select the name of that control that you want to have invoke the slide and drawer. And we have something called behavior services in FireMonkey that automatically invokes predefined behavior depending on the platform. And that's why, for example, on Android you see the tab controls and the tab items aligned to the top and on iOS on the bottom and that's automatically built in to make it really easy for you to adhere to the platform specific user interface guidelines. And we have done something very similar with the multi-view control and as Stephen mentioned it really transforms itself. So if you have it, for example, in landscape mode on an iPad the multi-view would be rendered as a docked panel, which is very similar to email clients that you might be running on an iPad. And if you run it on an iPhone in portrait mode, you'd get a slide and drawer automatically. So you don't have to code all these different behaviors to automatically built in for you as part of the control. Dave's asking about um, making the UIs kind of responsive uh, when you click on things. Now, Dave, one of the one of the best practices really around UI is to actually try and um, stop the code blocking up to let the UI just get back and um, do its stuff. Uh, and one of the really cool things that you can do uh, is use the Parallel Programming Library um, to make that help uh, to help that happen. Uh, and that's especially useful, especially if you're making calls out to the internet uh, and you don't want to kind of block the UI up whilst you're waiting for the response to come back. Um, and the Parallel Programming Library is, is a great way to do that. Um, so I'll just find a link. I've got some pretty good um, articles up on my blog for that. Um, so I'll just find a link for that in the chat for you. And Stephen, here's a question from Twan. It says, is there a way to scale T-button but not scale its assigned glyph? Scaling sometimes distorts the glyph. So every single UI element that is predefined that you can see in the style lookup drop-down menu was designed for the, to look good on all the different target platforms. So we have multiple resolution support, or so support for multiple resolutions across all the target platforms, which is why when you load a custom style and you want to have a custom style let's say on iOS and Android, you need to load the platform specific style because depending on the platform, the controls will have a different predefined size, etc., to look nice and crisp on all those different target platforms that we support. Now if you wanted to scale a button, for example, and not scale the glyph, you could right click on the control, select edit custom style, and then you can go in and resize the button to whatever you like and you can even drag and drop your own glyph control right onto the button in the integrated style designer to create your own button control. And I'll try to look for the YouTube link here for you for a, uh, another webinar that I did that covers that specifically. I see another question here that talks about when using the multi-detail appearance on Windows, the 32-bit version looks totally different. Uh, Paul, if you could send me an email with some screenshots on that, it's really hard to, to tell what that may be without seeing an example, but if you can send me an email, I'll put my email address in here again, um, that would be helpful. Okay, last chance for any, uh, any final questions for Serena. Serena, is there anything that you want to kind of um, add following the questions uh, that have been coming through already? Uh, well, the one thing I would say is that we have 
a great number of existing videos and webinars that cover custom styling, for example, how to apply a custom style, how to work with the Fire UI a multi device designer. We also have some deep dive sessions that I've done in the past that really go through all the tips and tricks around the Fire UI multi designer. We have um, sample projects that help you get started, whether it's the pre designed templates that you can access when you go to the File New menu or you access the demos. And We've, you, the different demos that we provide with the product, specifically the mobile snippets, they've all gone through a UI review to ensure that they adhere to guidelines. So if you're just starting out building multi-device applications or mobile applications for iOS and Android and you're coming from a Windows development environment and you're looking to build those types of applications, it's a really good idea to have a look at some of the samples to help you get started. So you can see how to, how to use the different controls, how to lay them out, how to align them, how to, you know, parent them to different controls, etc. So we have a lot of samples to help you get started. Okay, um, Mark's here asking about the um, trying to get a picture from the camera. He's finding the camera components a little bit slow for what he's wanting to do. Um, so Mark, one thing that you can have a look at is if you put an action list down into your application there's, um, and go file new standard action, within there you'll find T take photo from camera action. Now, if you add one of those into your project, um, you'll be able to see that there's some events in there uh, on uh, uh, on did ca cancel taking, on did finish taking. Um, the on did finish taking um, passes in an image, which is T bitmap. Now, that calls the the camera directly uh, and uses the standard camera um, uh, on the device rather than going through the camera component. Um, so uh, that will kind of give the whole uh, standard UI um, camera uh, control um, that they've got for the device. So on one of the things that kind of Android does is use this thing called Intents, um, and you can then set up a whole load of different applications that register to be something that can be for using a specific intent. So they could have different cameras um, components uh, installed on their, their Android device, and it will use whichever one that they're supposed to be using, and then we'll return the image back after it's done with that. And that's how Intense basically form a contract um, between the OS and, and the plugin, in essence, to pass the stuff back and forth. So that's a really nice way to be able to do it, uh, and will bypass um, kind of the, the slower um, T camera component. Okay, so you're using it for QR code reading. Um, we actually yeah. have a, a demo, Stephen. Remember when we did the <laughs> retail scenario for Rad Server webinar, we had Jim McKeith show a demo, I think it was on iOS or Android, using a QR code library. Do you remember that? I think it was. Yeah, I think that again was, um, uh, that actually comes back to the intents that there was uh, uh, a lot of Android devices now have QR code readers installed, um, specific applications for doing QR code reading. Um, so you can actually call for Android to provide you back the QR code from an intent. Um, and fetch the, the value back from that intent. Um, so that is another way to do it, and that would involve that would involve you, you know, completely bypassing the actual scanning of the barcode itself as well. Okay, and I've put in a link to a webinar we did on barcodes also that you might find helpful, Mark. Let's see, any other question? Where can you get the copper style? The copper style is part of the premium style pack which you can download if you have RAD Studio 10.2. Um, you can download it from Code Central. I don't know, Stephen, if you have the link handy, but it's on I Code Central. Um, I'll try to find it for you here real quick. Yeah, I'm just going to quit look for this. Um, Pat's asking about um, examples of using action lists. Uh, I'm just going to have a quick look. Um, well, I'll put directly actually into the, the chat. Uh, there's a link there for DocWiki. There's an awful lot of tutorials and step-by-steps within DocWiki, um, which is a great place to start. Um, also, if you've recently moved up, um, certainly uh, from Delphi 5, wow. Um, uh, basically, uh, I definitely have a look um, at Skill Sprints. Uh, if you just Google Skill Sprints, um, it will all come up. There's hundreds of them that have been done over the last few years. Um, definitely would be having a look at FireDAC. I don't know what you're using for database connectivity, Pat, but um, uh, FireDAC is just blazingly fast, um, and that would be a great way to, 
kind of speed up your applications. Um, it's direct replacement for the BDE um, in many ways. Um, so that's uh, that would definitely be something to have a look at. And you can use things like Refine to be able to migrate your code automatically from BDE up to FireDAC as well. So um, some pretty cool things to have a look at um, if you have moved up. Um, but uh, the big thing is just kind of getting in and, and running through it. Um, the one place I would actually say is worth having a look at is the Migration Upgrade Center. Uh, I don't know if you've been through that on the Embargo website. Uh, I'll just grab a link for that as well. Okay, uh, you're welcome, Mark. Um, yeah, no, it's always great getting some some really interesting questions and being a spend a bit of time with you guys, making sure that. Uh, you're getting on and carrying on forward. Uh, it's always lovely to hear what you're developing and, and making. Uh, you know, Serena's email is there. If you've got anything that's really kind of interesting and cool or quirky, um, then uh, do send the messages through. You know, it, it is always great to hear about what you guys are developing and creating. Uh, I think some of my favourite things I've heard, heard back over the last few years have been things like uh, automated cow milking machines, which are using 3D cameras to kind of scan and find others and locate them and kind of get um, you know, devices connected automatically and uh, things that are being used on oil rigs to uh, airplanes to you know, uh, you know, just general CRM type system um, work. So um, yeah, no, I always do kind of. Uh, it's it's lovely being able to spend some time and, and find out what you guys are doing as well. Yes, and to to join to what uh, Stephen was saying, please don't hesitate to send me an email. I will definitely respond to your email if you sent me a note over with some of those follow up questions. I can point you to some additional links and some blog posts that I've done and. Another great thing that I really like about customers contacting me is it also gives me a lot of great new topics that I can then integrate and uh, focus on in future blog posts. So if you have specific questions that you think, oh, they, those have never been covered by a blog post, those have never been covered in a YouTube video, please don't hesitate to contact me and I will put those on my list for future blog posts. I think with that, Stephen, I think, I think we uh, are pretty much done, yes. So um, thank you again, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, I've been really, really interesting. Thank you, Serena, for your time. Um, happy coding, everybody, and uh, we'll catch you all soon. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. The Copper Style is part of the Premium Style Pack, which you can find on Code Central. It's the Premium Style Pack for Rad Studio 10.1 Berlin and 10.2 Tokyo, and you can find that on Code Central. Now, another question came up, when should you be using views versus the master form? If you are looking to have the same application across all platforms and are not planning on tweaking the user interface for a specific form factor or device, then you can just work with the master. If you want to have, for example, an iOS-specific view and an Android-specific view and want to have different behavior on iOS than Android, then you would want to create at least one platform-specific view, and that can be either an iPad view or an iPhone view. It doesn't really matter which one you choose if you just want to have platform-specific behavior. If you want to customize the UI for a phone form factor compared to a tablet form factor, then you can create a, a phone form factor and a tablet form factor for each of the different uh, platforms you're looking to target. So for example, an iPhone view, iPhone 4.7 inch view, and an iPad view, and an Android 5-inch view and an Android 10-inch uh, tablet view, for example. Now, when it comes to customizing styles, is another question that came up is how do you customize the style? You can use the built-in native styles that we provide automatically for each of the four supported platforms, Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android with FireMonkey. You can also customize an existing style element by right-clicking it on the form, which in turn brings up the integrated style designer, and that will allow you to load in different graphics, change colors, etc. if you want to customize it for a specific style element. We also have the premium styles, which I just mentioned, and we have something called the bitmap style designer, which allows you to create your own custom styles. And if you're interested in that, you can go to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Embarcadero TechNet to find some recordings and videos and webinar replays on how to create your own custom style. Now another question that came up, should the toolbar sit above or below on Android? Toolbar generally is displayed at the top. The tab control has something called behavior services built into it. And what that allows you to do is automatically display tabs at the top without any glyph buttons on Android. And at the bottom, 
with glyph buttons on iOS. And that is automatically hand handled through the control. You can overwrite that through the tap position property on T-Tap control, but if you don't want to overwrite it, it's automatically built in and you can leverage what we've what we're providing out of the box. In regards to a toolbar, there's also the concept of a top toolbar and a bottom toolbar. So you could have a, a top toolbar, for example, that has your application title. If you are building like a photo application, it has the title and maybe load photo and save photo. And then at the bottom, you can have a toolbar with a segmented control on it where you can adjust the filters, for example, a sepia filter, adjust the use saturation, etc. So you can certainly have top tool, a top toolbar and a bottom toolbar, but if you're just opting for one, that should be aligned to the top on Android, and that's really should be aligned on the top across all the supported platforms. Now, if you have any other questions, you can enter them now in the questions pane, and we'll go through uh, anything else that comes up. Um, otherwise, this will be made available as a replay. Uh, probably within the next week or so on YouTube, and you'll be able to view it again. And if you have any questions, you can also send me an email to serena.dupont at embarcadero.com. Now, there's another question. When designing multiple resolution images, is it better to have separ several separate images or one image file with multiple resolutions stored inside? How many image resolutions would you advise for, some, for a multiple device app? Personally, I found that you want to have multiple resolutions. So if you're using T-Image, there is a multi-res bitmap property that allows you to define custom images. So what I tend to do is if you're using a background image, for example, I would go for 1x, 2x, and 3x. So if you had, if your background image was 100 by 100, that would be 1x, 200 by 200 would be 2x, and 300 by 300 pixel would be 3x you would want to load that into T-Image and define it for the multi-res bitmap. Um, that's what I would recommend you do, especially for something like background images or wherever you are going to have an image that's relatively big to ensure it looks crisp. And that's, we have some examples that further highlight that on some blog posts on it as well. But generally speaking, I would say you should have several images that are the same, that are the uh, designed for the different resolutions rather than starting out with a large image. If you could, one thing that you should do if you're starting out with a background image, I would start with the highest resolution, like if you're getting it from a stock image provider, for example, get a larger resolution image that fits the, uh, you know, fits the large resolution retina device and you can downscale that into, you know, 50% of the size and, you know, 25% of the size, etc if you're scaling images. The same is also true if you're using icons, if you want to load in your own custom icons. And let's say you have an icon generally that's maybe 50 by 50 pixels and you would want to have a 100 by 100 pixels and you know and so forth, so on and so forth. So generally I would say 1x because 1x is the resolution that's shown at design time and then 2x and 3x should cover all the different use cases. Hopefully that answered your question and if you have any follow-up questions on that you can send me an email to serena.dupont at embarcadero.com. And with that, if there are no other questions, um, I wanted to thank you again for attending this webinar. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions, and we'll make the replay available within about a week or so, and you should be receiving an email once it's available on YouTube. Well, thanks again for joining, and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Great session. Thank you, Serena. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.